Warning, this content is for entertainment and educational purposes only. This video is brought to you by First Detachment Nutrition. Battle tested, expert formulated. Use discount code AB10 at checkout for 10% off. All right, folks, this is part two of my interview with Paul Carter. I really enjoyed this interview. I had no idea that we were on for almost three hours, so I had to break this up into two parts. Uh, Paul had some really interesting and insightful thoughts on training. I really enjoyed talking to him. This picks up where we left off the last time, talking about adjusting volume, intensity, and load based on how your training is going, what you're doing in each area. I hope you will enjoy the rest of this. I had a lot of fun talking to Paul, and it was one of the more interesting conversations I've had on an interview. You had three, right? It was, it was volume... Effort is what you're saying. Intensity, yeah. effort, so how close you're going to failure, yep. load. and then and then frequency, yep. and then I also factor load into it too. Um, I think of load would be a little different conversation because load is going to. I feel yeah. like if I'm training, maybe I'm wrong on this, and you can no, I, I, I don't want to hear your. I want to hear your thoughts, but I feel like if I am training in the four to five rep range, let's say, for example, like you mentioned versus the 10 or 12, 10 to 12. Me personally, I feel like I need, I need to I'd make some adjustments elsewhere. I'm going to need more time to recover. I need to probably have less volume. Um, you know, m m maybe intensity. I need to ratchet down just a little bit. You know, like you'll notice like power lifters, you never see power lifters training to failure ever. Like they just, no, I did powerlifting for 10 years. But we're also in powerlifting, you're you're not wanting to train to failure because the fatigue from failure can actually screw with motor unit recruitment and right. the patterns. So there's kind of a different kind of a kind of a different thing going on there. Yeah, I'm just curious to what your thoughts are on that because I, I probably believe me, I training is probably the area that I'm the least knowledgeable in when it comes to, you know, out of the out of the pillars of what I consider hypertrophy, which is hormones, nutrition, and training. But I that's sort of my oversimplified way of looking at it. If I if I'm cranking one knob all the way up, I gotta make an adjustment somewhere else. Okay. So let's get into this one because this is one of my favorites. But because there's a, a pretty big misconception about this one that that I think goes around. And that one is it's that if heavier loading causes more systemic fatigue. I bet money you've heard this said yeah. by somebody. What system? Yeah, it's good. When question. I ask this question, and I'm not putting you on the spot. I, I'm this is more like a let's get the art, let's get the discussion out there. So when people use the term system, systemic fatigue, all fatigue is let's define fatigue first. So fatigue is a uh, a temporary reduction in performance, essentially. To, fatigue can be defined as there is a a temporary performance reduction. That's, that's essentially what fatigue is. So when people say systemic fatigue, and there's like kind of a whole sect out there that uses this term systemic fatigue, and every time they say this, I, I ask, what, what system are you talking about? Are we talking about the peripheral level at the actual muscular system? Because that's a different system of fatigue we're talking about. Are we talking about the central nervous system fatigue level because there's there's spinal level fatigue and there's super spinal level fatigue. Are we talking about the autotomic nervous system where there's the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic yeah. nervous system? So when people say systemic fatigue, here's what, and this is like, I'm not trying to kick anybody in the nuts about this. Most of the time people say that I don't think they know what they're talking about. So we have to define, oh, here's the thing. So I'll also say this, all of those quote unquote systems can be measured in some way for fatigue. It's not this like fairy pixie dust thing going on. And like, I'm tired. I feel tired. The feeling of tired is not fatigue. Like you can feel tired and not actually be suffering from central nervous system fatigue. 
you can just say I'm I'm, I'm you know I'm tired. You can be tired for a multitude of reasons. You can be be tired and not be suffering from peripheral fatigue. Any of these systems that people talk about have things you can measure them with. So, for example, I'll give you an example. If you wanted to to set a baseline for measuring the amount of central nervous system fatigue you were suffering from, you would do it with a an explosive movement, like a vertical jump or say a medicine ball throw or something like that for distance. So let's say you go into the gym. This would actually be a good, if you had one of those things, you know, those vertical jump height things, you jump up and touch. Yeah, yeah. You, has, you probably have those for basketball. So whenever you do an explosive movement, you get pretty much maximum amount of motor unit recruitment that you're going to get. So you just have a low degree of force because the cross bridging happens at the acumen myosin levels. It's too quickly. So there's a very low degree of force. Right. But we're talking about in terms of power. So like those people get those things mixed up. So if you're doing a vertical jump, you're actually testing how how high you can get on that motor unit recruitment scale, because you have to recruit all of your largest fiber types to get that explosive movement. Right. So if you set something like a vertical jump, like as a baseline. And then you went in and each time you did your workout, you tested your vertical jump. You could actually see if you were suffering from central nervous system fatigue. You would actually be able to see, okay, I'm really low down. I had a buddy, Ben, who was doing dog crap at the time. Remember Mm -hmm. Dante's whole Widowmaker things? Always like higher. He said, nothing tank my vertical jump faster than those, those high rep leg sets. Those things were brutal. Well, the reason why that is, is because of the amount of muscle damage that goes on. And then there's a a massive amount of central nervous system fatigue that goes on from that muscle damage. And so then you can't recruit those high threshold motor units. So you're not getting to those largest fibers again. So when people talk about heavier loading and lower reps, those are less fatiguing than higher rep sets. And even if you go to a higher rep set, we have a, there's a study called, um, it's one of my favorite studies. It's velocity loss. I can actually, I can probably bring it up right now, but it's one of my favorites. Um, if you want to send me the link, just uh, I'll put it in the video description so people can check it out. Velocity loss as an indicator of neuromuscular fatigue during resistance training. So if anybody wants to go look that up, but I'll send, I'll send it to you. That study looked at even the difference in fatigue in eight and 12 rep sets and the difference in fatigue, neuromuscular fatigue from eight reps is very significant than just than 12 reps. So once you get to 12 reps, you're already suffering from way more neuromuscular fatigue than yourself. Hmm, interesting. Yes. So we see this every time, every single study where we look at light loading or you're doing a lot of reps has infinitely more fatigue that comes with it. Because there's going to be way more muscle damage that comes with that. There's going to be way more spinal level fatigue. There's going to be way more metabolite accumulation, which is going to cause way more central nervous system fatigue within the training session itself. So we have different levels of fatigue that occur in the training session. So we have kind of fatigue mechanisms that happen very rapidly and come up very fast. And that's going to be most of your metabolite related stuff. And that's going to reduce our ability to recruit motor units. And then we have kind of the longer one that occurs over the training session from calcium ion related fatigue that's going to cause the muscle damage. And this is going to be from doing higher volumes, training muscles at longer lengths, Um, higher rep sets will do it too, training to failure. So there's like a multitude of things that we can look at to say what is going to really push a high degree of calcium ions into that intracellular area, into into the cytoplasm. That's going to call that a, cause that apoptosis, it causes that muscle damage, and it causes a subsequent degree of central nervous system fatigue in the following workouts. So the one that we see kind of in the workout. The one that you will feel from a central nervous system fatigue is that when we're training, especially because somebody will say, what about that feeling that you get where you're doing the big, heavy, big compounds and stuff like that? Well, when we're doing compound movements, we will have a higher degree of expression of pro-inflammatory cytokines. And those the pro-inflammatory cytokines will cause, they also to create a, a type of afferent feedback to the central nervous system that causes a reduction in motor unit recruitment as well. So 
there's a multitude of different kinds of fatigues that we're dealing with here. However, overall, the standpoint of fatigue reduction is going to be best if you're training in lower reps and leaving one or two reps in the tank. So the idea of say, well, the, and if you go look at the one study I just, I just mentioned for you, even if you do a two RIR on 12 to 15 reps or whatever, you've already lost all the benefits of the RIR. You still end up suffering from the, 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 the fatigue. So as the set goes on, the, there's, um, gosh, why can't I remember? There's the, 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 basically the electrical signals that come down the spine, those, because they're just having to go over and over, there's a certain amount of fatigue that happens from them having to emit that electrical signal over and over and over again. And then you get the central nerve, you get the afferent feedback from the afferent nerves to the actual sensory part of the brain that says, I detect this like really burny, like painful sensation. So I'm going to reduce motor neuron recruitment. Anything that offers up a negative feedback loop to the sensory part of the brain is going to reduce motor neuron recruitment. So the idea, and this has been set around bodybuilding circles for a long time. And every time it does, I'm just like, okay, that's, this discussion is probably going to go on for a long time. Is that like doing like higher reps with, with lighter loads or two IRs is I'm getting the same amount of stimulus, but I'm eliminating fatigue. I'm like, that's not actually how it works. It's like when then some people say well, doing heavy compounds, with low reps is going to cause way more systemic fatigue. I'm like, what's the, the first thing I say is what system. And when they can't tell me what system, I'm like, if you can't tell me what system, then. Well, you caught me. <laughs> yeah. Right. So if you have to understand what system it is because strength training, the one you hear about oftentimes in strength training is the, you'll hear about the sympathetic nervous system or the parasympathetic nervous system. Strength training doesn't actually affect those. And we've, we've actually tested that cardiovascular. Cardio. Yeah. So you knew that one. Yeah. Right? So cardio. <laughs> so you, for years there, that's good. Do you know how to do that one, Paul? Cause I'm like, God, that one I had to get around so much. So the HRV testing stuff was going on for a long time with people with strength training. I'm like, dude, why are you guys looking at that? The strength training has no effect on this. It's the cardiovascular work that affects the HRV stuff. I experienced that first hand on a contest prep. This is why I'm very familiar with it. I overdid the cardio on a contest prep. And I remember I came into the gym one day and dude, I'm, I'm not shitting you. I couldn't even press two plates on the leg press. My body just said, no, I'm done. Right. And that is, if you up that, there's some, the, and I can't remember because I didn't get, I I've got, never had that happen in my life before, yeah, but it's just but my legs the, wouldn't fire at all. Okay. So now you see what I'm talking about when I say systems, we need to understand what yep. system is fatigue. So when we're talking about if we're causing central nervous system fatigue, why well, are we talking about central nervous system? System fatigue that's being caused by metabolite accumulation, pro-inflammatory cytokines, inflammation from muscle damage. Like what is actually causing? We can have central nervous system a reduction in motor unit recruitment for a multitude of reasons. But if we're talking about fatiguing mechanisms, then we have to say, okay, what system are we talking about? And then what is causing that particular fatigue? So when people say systemic fatigue, like I said, if, if there's anything you got out of this podcast, you from, from now on, you're going forward, you can say, well, what system are you talking about? So are we talking about the peripheral system? And that would be at the, the actual muscular la layer. So at the muscular level, we're talking about whether or not excitation, contraction, coupling failure is occurring. And what that is, is when the brain sends down that electrical signal into the triadic junction at the muscular level, that signal actually gets to a voltage sister and it has to talk to the calcium store and the calcium goes in and it actually reduces the, the troponin binding site, right? So there can be an actual contraction that occurs. So if we have excitation contraction coupling failure occurring, there's actually, there's a, a communication stops occurring at the triadic junction. So those fibers, those largest fibers at that top end of the high threshold motor unit pool, they don't actually experience mechanical tension anymore. They do not experience mechanical tension because we have that disconnect there that's going on because we still need that electrical signal that comes down. That's going to create, that's an action potential. That's what we're measuring essentially with EMG. That is an action potential that basically kicks off that whole process there with calcium ions and contractions. So that gets broken. So we don't actually get to experience. So the fatigue there is calcium ion related fatigue and we don't experience mechanical tension. So there's a, there's a force production reduction. That occurs. 
What's interesting about even like the pump conversation is back in 2019, they did a study in vitro that looked at swelling from the pump and saw that both in rats and humans that the pump actually caused excitation contraction coupling failure, which means there was a reduction in mechanical tension from the pump style training. Interesting. Yes. So Chris sent that over to me one morning. We've been doing this so long. We just do this pretty cool thing. He goes, read this study and tell me what you see. And I replied back to him. I go, are they saying that the pump caused a reduction in force production? That the pump actually caused excitation, contraction, coupling failure? And he started laughing. He's like, yeah, but they don't want to talk about that. Well, you can always you can always see it. Like I uh, post show, and of course, this is just an anecdote. I don't know. This is just me being a body dumb bodybuilder. But like post show, like when you start eating food again and get those crazy pumps, I can never do as many reps, right? As like you know, like I like I'm like I have to stop short of where I normally am because the pumps are so nasty. They like I just things just stop working. And and the interesting thing is, do you do you when you go into when you're getting into a show? And I remember we asked about your whole chicken and rice comment because I, I do like it. I think it's simplifying diets for as far as bodybuilding goes is a real thing. But do you cut carbs pretty significantly? I'm a carb guy. Like I, it's it really like we talked about how different people are, but I need carbs where I just flatten out, and yeah. my body seems to deal with carbs. I mean, I ate a thousand grams of carbs the day before my show yeah you know i'm one of those people but, but you drop your fat you drop your fat really low yeah i tend to run better on lower fat higher carbs but not yeah, I, did, no way. I, did, I did too dude that i did my last show dude i never had to do the low carb drop like everybody else but i pull out my fat and i would do really well with low fats and higher carb intake as far as like getting i pull stuff. the carbs out and keep the fats up i get flat as a pancake and i feel like shit Okay, so here I'm gonna give I'm gonna give you this one since you like the dietary stuff. So remember back when keto got popular again? Yeah. Keto got really popular again. And you they did multiple studies, longitudinal hypertrophy studies, trying to use different dietary approaches. And the keto groups could never build any muscle. No. Like not even in surpluses. Now this pisses people off. But I'm like, bro, this is, here's the thing, Paul, this is what gets back to, are we going to cling to an ideology or are we going to talk about the data? And that's where people, they, they get mad and they're like, Paul's an answer. I'm like, dude, I am just giving you the data. So in all of the keto studies that they looked at, even the ones where they tried to push them into a surplus, they couldn't grow. They wouldn't grow. And no. If they did grow, it was very, it, compared to the low fat, high carb group, it was very minuscule in amount. So... A couple of years ago, when Chris and I were working together, we, we don't get into the nutrition stuff much, but we actually found the research showing when you're glycogen depleted, it causes excitation, contraction, coupling failure, which also what we just talked about. So those largest fibers, they don't experience mechanical tension. So when you people are going into keto, those largest fibers that needed to experience mechanical tension to grow they just didn't experience mechanical tension because of the low glycogen source now we don't know some of the mechanism as to why that happens but it all lines up really clear so when alan aragon got in this fight again with somebody online about debating i actually sent the data over to alan i go alan just go to the mechanism so when you go to keto basically you suffer suffer from excitation contraction coupling failure so you actually do not get mechanical tension at the largest fiber layers and he's like sweet so then he was able because Alan likes debating people and, and like, you know, taking them to task on like what the data shows. So when you actually go to very low carb and then the, the, but there's also some sensor, sensory effects that happen. And we had Joe, I don't know if you follow Joe, Agu. he's a really good nutritional yeah. guy. If you don't, you should. He was on our show too. We've had him on multiple times to talk about the fact that um, there's a multitude of problems also that you would probably be interested in. When your 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 training is your biggest anti fatigue mechanism, how you're situating your training, kind of as we were just talking about, and then the higher your inflammatory response is, the less your glucose transporter can actually get into the cell to do glucose transport. So we're talking about how the fact that you're training going into like peak week and that kind of stuff, you should have the least amount of inflammation in your body as possible to be able to store the greatest amount of glycogen into the muscle cells as possible. So there's a lot of 
from a training standpoint of not only muscle retention, but growing muscle, really carb is your best friend. I mean, it, it's, I don't know how people, can you grow muscle on a low carb diet? You can, but it's like the least effective approach you could ever take. Yeah. I mean, all you have to, if anybody ever wants to put it to test, all you have to do is not eat carbs for a week and then eat carbs for a week afterwards and see what happens in the gym. I mean, it's, <laughs> I, I just like, I, I don't know how it's, it's indisputable to me. I, I love when we have, when we have arguments online and then you can actually just tell somebody, dude, just go do it. Just go do it one time. Just do, you don't need to like argue a study here. I'll, I'll do this for example. The training to failure thing came up. Did you see my post about training to failure? Training to failure has nothing to do with muscles producing force. Like everybody has said that forever. It has nothing to do with muscles producing force. So it has to do with reaching the maximum tolerable perception of effort in your brain when you can't recruit motor units anymore. But I'm like, you can go in and test this in the gym. So you can do this with bilateral exercise going to unilateral exercises. Some people are like, well, it's when muscles start, can't produce force anymore. I'm like, your muscles are always able to produce more force. You can't do that. So if you go in and you do dumbbell curls, do them at the same time. And then when you hit failure, you can't get another rep, sink, switch over. You can get at least one more doing single arm version. You've probably done this before. Yeah. Right? Yep. Okay. So your muscles weren't incapable of producing force anymore. When you went to the single arm version, right, it doesn't require as much perception. The perception of effort is smaller to do a single unilateral movement, right? So you immediately reduce your perception of effort. So you were able to do another curl. You, I did this with those like cable flies the other day. You go, go do cable flies and go until you can't get another rep. And then do, you'll be able to finish up and get one or two single arm cable flies after you're, you're not able to get the bilateral cable fly version anymore. That's interesting. You can do it every time. So it has nothing to do with your muscles producing force. So, and I had like these on videos and I do them all the time to show people. And I do them with cross body extensions. Or I'm doing cross body extensions and I'm lying on the floor. And then I can't, literally, can I get another rep? I lower it and then I do a bunch of single, single arm one by one. Anything you can do that reduces the maximal tolerable perception of effort, you can do more of. That's wild. So it has nothing to do with your muscles producing force. And people have said that forever, right? They're like, you hit failure because your muscles can't produce force anymore. I'm like, they can keep producing force. What are you talking about? It has nothing to do with that. So that's one of those things like what you're talking about with carbs. You're like, okay, if you don't think this is the case, just don't eat any carbs at all for one week and then go eat like a thousand grams of carbs over a day and then see what your workouts are like for the next three days. You can do that kind of stuff and just test that on yourself rather than arguing with people online. Lots of these kind of stuff we actually did, right? Like we would experiment yep. and do and figure these things out. So with the when people would ask me that, that's why I, when the study started coming out on protein, here was one, and not throwing Dante under the bus, but the one that got pushed, even in the bodybuilding circles forever, remember, was the protein. You got to like eat like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of grams of protein. And you really just don't. No. Like, you don't. That is probably, Paul, don't you think? Because you, you delve in the nutrition side a little bit. Yep. Clearly more than I do now. Do you not think protein has become the most overrated thing talked about in nutrition that there is? At this point? I, I, I did. This This blows my mind because people people see how little protein I eat and they, they're they blown away. I mean, you can just do the math on it, man. Um, I mean, a, a pound of protein, or I mean, a pound of muscle tissue, just, just, Let's just say that it was all protein structures, which it's not. It's like what 20, 30 percent protein structures, something like 20, that. 20 ish, and the rest of it's water. Yeah, 20 of it. And so, so we're, we're talking about, I think there's about what is it, four, 400 or so grams in a pound, right? Right. And it, so we're talking about 80 grams of actual protein structures and a pound of muscle. So that's, you know, you're going to have protein turnover and well, you're, 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 there's a, amino acid pool that the body has to maintain or whatnot but if you're if we're talking about actual actual hypertrophy to to facilitate a pound of new muscle tissue we're talking about 80 grams of actual protein it's not very much that was actually something mentor did get right in the 70s you remember him talking about the dietary yep. stuff and he broke all the numbers down and nobody wanted to believe it and he's like you don't really have to eat much over maintenance at all in order to grow and you don't need like these hundreds and hundreds of grams of protein 
So then we get into the nineties and we have these quote mass monsters, remember? And and yep. they were eating like 400 was it greg kovacs was eating like 500 grams of protein or something 600 like, 800 something like it that was some insane. wild amount so then we had all of those hyper protein studies josie antonio did out of the iss and they all looked like that kind of stuff and there was actually a little bit better body recomposition more than likely due to the thermic effect of yeah the it's the thermic effect of the protein yeah it, but even with dudes eating upwards of 400 grams, they gained no more muscle tissue than the guys that were eating no. like 0.8. I, I, I think that what happens, I think that you'll probably agree with this. I think that what happens in our industry often is there's massive knee jerk reactions to finding something is wrong. So if people go, we don't eat enough protein. Well, we need to eat 400 grams of protein. Like it can't, <laughs> there's, there's like, we don't find that proper middle ground. You can look at, bodybuilding in the 90s what what changed in the 90s versus before why what what changed that made guys bigger there it, to me it's really simple it's a simple thing i Is thought it was it's, it's you had to be looking at the insulin and gh use wasn't yeah it? it was insulin and gh that's it man yeah that's what changed that's why guys got bigger that's it yep yeah that's, <laughs> so that's the end of the conversation like we didn't have to debate. i'm like it was just insulin and gh because guys went from the eighties and like Haney was like the biggest guy, but I mean, it wasn't like, I mean, who was, was the, what's his name? Samir. Yeah. Banu. Yeah. Like, like those, those guys were all jacked. That looked amazing. Right. But Haney was only a little bigger than everybody else. He wasn't like a Ronnie Coleman. No. And then Dorian came along and I personally, just for my own personal taste, Dorian's, Physique at Night of the Champions year he won was my favorite physique he presented. I think yeah, that was his best. Yeah, dude, he looked amazing. He was like 232 or 233 pounds yep. or something. He looked freaking phenomenal. I personally did not like his physique that he got later when he was um, – everybody still marvels over it. Yes, he was a mass monster and huge, all that, but to me – when he was when he won the night of the champions, and I think it was probably his first his first Olympia appearance, those two physiques, in my opinion, were his best ones. Especially his, his night of the champions. If nobody's looked at that physique, I think to me that's like he would look like he was mad. He was like a Greek statue. He was like he was carved out of absolute granite. But what happened later, yes, was that everybody started pushing insulin and GH. And I think yeah, it was that simple. Training didn't change that much. Nutrition didn't change that much. Guess. The, the only thing that changed is they they started taking more shit. Yep, guys weren't coming off; they were running shit year round, and then insulin and GH. <laughs> That's what changed. <laughs> the only thing that changed was the drug protocols. I don't know why people do not realize this. So you're right; people went from back in Arnold's. I remember guys would come off, and Arnold talked about the fact that they yeah. they didn't they didn't use drugs year round. Kevin Levron was really. He was really open about his talk that he would come off in the off season and people would make fun of him. Remember, Kevin would be running around like a buck ninety. Oh yeah, he's a local guy. He he's from my area, man. And we we'd see him running around in the off season. He just looked like a regular dude. And then you just know, eight dude. weeks later, he looked like Mister Olympia. <laughs> it's the wildest shit I've ever seen, man. When Kevin would get back on, it was incredible. Yeah. There would be those pictures of him in the off season. And you think he got injured or something happened or whatever. And he's just like this normal looking dude. And then come Olympia time, he would be Kevin Lebron. Like he, it, it would be like three months later. Well, he had a band and he yes. was tour with his band and he just didn't give a fuck. He would just stop lifting and eating and everything. Just go play. I think he played the bass and, you know, he was out having I fun. I about the band thing. I forgot about the band thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, he, he would go on tour and just completely stop training. It was it was wild. I mean, yeah, that uh, was that was the only thing that really changed, um, in terms of like why guys got builder bigger. And now, if you get into, I now I've heard stuff. I've heard this. Now, this is another thing I've heard. And I, I don't, I don't want to say somebody's name. It's a, it's a kind of a kind of a nobody, but it's um, um. I don't know how you feel. There's some guys in the industry that are really known for their drug protocol stuff. Yeah. Do you know who I'm talking about? Yeah, I know who you're talking about. I don't know how you feel about him. I don't like him. Okay. 
Well, then we're probably are we are we talking about the same guy? Probably. I, I, I think so. You know what I'm talking about? He's very uh, contrarian. Gets like the the safer use man. I don't know if he, he's that. I just had somebody ask me one time if I use ever use his drug protocols, and I'm like, I didn't. I don't know anything about his drug product protocols because number he one, names the he names the drug protocols after himself. We may be talking about the same guy. Yeah, yeah. There's only one guy. He yeah, pisses everybody off. Yeah, but is he in a fight with everybody all the time? Yeah, everybody. Yes. Okay. Somebody would say that about me, but I'm actually not. People are actually always starting stuff with me. I actually, I actually love people, but um. The I think he said something to the effect of, and if I say this, then you maybe we're talking that nothing in terms of like physiology or anatomy has trained in like the last thirty years. And on one point, I would agree with you. Yeah, that's 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 pretty much true. Anatomy anatomy hasn't changed. What we understand about fatigue, like I talked about, what we understand about a lot of different training mechanisms has changed because in ninety one, it was ninety one. Whenever they said that muscle. Uh, was torn down and built back bigger. And then they ran with that as a an actual thing for a long time. And we still haven't fully killed off the metabolic stress thing yet. That despite the fact that Stu Phillips and his well, clearly I'm wrong about that. <laughs> you know what? Clearly I'm wrong about that. Well, the meta the, okay. So the metabolic stress thing still goes around, and this is how okay. So like we'll just go. We'll, we'll do this one too. For years. This I think you'll find this interesting, Paul. So we learned about actinomycin all the way back in 1953. Mm-hmm. Actinomycin, functional units of protein, this is what they are. And then even at that time, they were able to identify something else in there, but not fully because we didn't have the technology for it. That was a larger molecule of protein. Later turned out to be type which we learned about in the 1970s. So when they were doing hypertrophy studies in as late as 1979, I can send you this study too. They come to the end of it and they go, do you know what causes muscle growth? Mechanical tension, active active mechanical tension and passive mechanical tension. And that was pretty much the end of it. And then exercise scientists guys ran around for the next 45, 50 years going, well, we don't know how muscle grows. It's multifaceted. There's a whole bunch of things that can cause it, blah, 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 blah. But there's really not. So the reason why that happened was because whenever they were doing the rep range stuff, then they would say, how are we getting the same amount of muscle growth from four sets of 15 reps as we're getting from four sets of five reps? We don't understand how that's happening. So what they tried to do is, and this is the myth, and it is a myth, is like, oh, so the the four reps of 15 is giving you this much mechanical tension, right? And then the four sets of five reps was like giving you this much. And then something has to make up this gap in here. So, oh, hey, look, it's metabolic stress. But then you have to ask yourself this very simple question. Somehow metabolic stress magically makes up the exact amount of muscle growth in every single person every time they, they test this. That's pretty wild. So that was the thing. Oh, and muscle damage. Muscle damage also is in there too. So muscle is torn down, built back bigger. That's one of those processes. We know that's not how muscle growth works. It's not torn down, built back bigger. So the the metabolic stress one went around forever. So one of the things I do like about research that a lot of bodybuilders don't understand is is that the a lot of the researchers in physiology do pay attention to what's going on on the you know ground zero that bodybuilders are doing and going well let's test this and see like what's happening with that so they started trying to find ways that they could show that the pump or metabolic stress all this kind of stuff could contribute to muscle growth so the key one was lactate forever it was like lactate is it's got to be causing anabolic signaling here's how it's doing it so forth and so on in order to look at this stuff, we have to be able to isolate it off from a mechanism that we know causes muscle growth, right? So if we know mechanical tension causes muscle growth, then we have to be able to look at metabolic stress more in an isolated fashion to see if that in itself can do it. So we tried that every which way possible. We tried doing stuff like doing blood flow restriction stuff and then throwing blood flow restriction on immediately after training to increase metabolite accumulation through the roof to see if there was like some type of hypertrophic addition that happened, never happened. We went so far as injecting lactate into people to see if, yeah, people ignore these studies. They're out there, bro. So Chris and I went over all these in our podcast about metabolic stress. 
So Stu Phillips actually made an Instagram, I think it was probably six months ago, about he called it dead theories of hypertrophy. And he said, brought up the metabolic stress when there his lab did three different studies. Absolutely. And he's one of the ro- most robust, well-respected researchers out there in terms of looking at hypertrophy stuff. And he's like, he just called it one of the dead theories of hypertrophy. He's like, it was never really alive. He goes, and he literally said, it's on his Instagram. He's like, no serious researcher ever took metabolic stress serious as a hypertrophy catalyst. So despite the fact that that's still been running around this whole time. So like I said, his, I think they did three studies in a row out of their lab. And then those studies were, they they came to the same conclusion as the other ones. And then if you just even went back to the meta analysis, meta analysis review on lactate that came out, I think it was like a more, just a year or two ago, they admit down at the bottom that they don't actually have any studies that show you can connect metabolic stress to muscle growth. That still hasn't stopped everybody from running around saying that metabolic stress causes muscle growth, but it doesn't. So all that happens, it's the same mechanisms that cause muscle growth regardless of the rep range that you're using. The only times that we can get out of that where it doesn't happen is if you give a, get above something like 50 reps where you don't even get vanal occlusion. So there's not even, you don't even get enough vanal occlusion to cause metabolites to get trapped in to cause fatigue. It actually causes all this stuff to kind of transpire. So all you need are two principles. You need to understand motor unit recruitment and you need to understand the force velocity relationship. And that's what gives you mechanical tension. And no matter what you look at, when you, if you're training 15 reps, by the time you get to the end, you're go, you have to voluntarily push hard, right? To get those last yep. few reps, which increases motor unit recruitment. And you have a slowing of contraction velocity, those last four or five reps which means there's a high degree of cross bridging, which is experienced as force, high degree of mechanical tension. When you're doing a set of five reps or whatever, right? We talked about that earlier. If it's a five, if it's five reps with a six rep max, you have pretty much have maximum motor unit recruitment from that first rep, right? And so all of those reps are kind of, if you took a five rep max or six, six rep max and you try to move that weight intentionally slow, you can't do it, right? You have to try to move right. it as hard as you can. So there's your high degree of effort. There's your maximum motor unit recruitment. The reps get slowed pretty fast. If you're doing a, a five reps with a six rep max, they get slowed pretty fast, right? And so there's your force velocity relationship. There's your high degree of cross bridging. Your muscles are trying to produce the fibers that are active are trying to produce a high degree of force. There's your mechanical tension. It's the same mechanisms every time. Yeah. So, I mean, it's pretty indisputable. It's mechanical det- tension that causes muscle growth. I mean, I think that's and they, pretty, they, pretty well established. I think they've run around trying to figure out that. And lactate's just waste product, right? Yeah. I mean, for pretty much for the most part, it, it's distributed all over the body. Like once, that, yeah. once you start producing. So every muscle contraction that you you do produces lactate. Yeah. So the only thing that happens is as you continue, you know, it's acidosis and, and metabolic stress, as you do more and more and more repetitions, there's just more of it produced. Yep. So it, it's it's every single muscle contraction you do produces lactate. So the idea that it was, if you want to go, if you want to go somewhere and look where there's a ton of metabolic stress produce, produced, go to 800 and 1200 meter sprints. There's tons of metabolic stress produced, but that won't produce muscle growth. So no. you'd again, you'd have to go and you'd have to find a way to isolate off. And I know there's been some other studies people have tried to say. So there's one that was tried to be referenced. So these are pretty annoying to me. I had to end up reading these as well, explaining them to people. Is that there was one where this showed swelling. They did acute and chronic swelling measurements, and they said, well, here in the vastus lateralis, there was more acute swelling and then there was more chronic hypertrophy measured and i'm like okay do you know what this study is this is a type 2 muscle fiber study so if there's we just talked about earlier if there's a type 2 muscle fiber they produce more metabolites because they're more glycolytic and also because they're more easily damaged there's more swelling because there's more edema because they're more easily damaged so these are really easily explainable things once you understand the physiology none of these things show that there's a it's core it's it's at the, the it's the weakest possible example of causation by correlation. So you can't 
you just have to understand what you're looking at from a physiological standpoint. But a lot of people, they just read the headline of the study and they don't go any further. Then they go to like the last two sentences of the abstract and they're like, well, this study showed that. I'm like, that's not what that study showed. That study showed that the type two muscle fibers produce more metabolites. And if it's a type two muscle fiber, then it's going to grow larger than the other smaller type one muscle fibers. This is really easy stuff. Yeah, so, I mean, it's it's pretty, it seems pretty straightforward. Now you can debate all the little nuances of getting there, but it's, it is mechanical tension at the end of the day, right? That's, that's really it. And we should, we just need, we need a sufficient amount in order for that mechanical signal to kick off that biological process. So that really doesn't take that much. And that's, you know, kind of the other, that's the volume thing. It's like, well, how many sets does it take to maintain? How many sets, if you just wanted to maintain, go through the rest of your life, never, never, if you just wanted to maintain, you say, I'm going to put myself in maintenance mode for the next two years. How much volume would you do? I mean, you, I could probably get away with almost none, like, you know, a couple sets, <laughs> right? You could probably literally go in each week and do like two sets, right? Yeah. Two hard sets and you would maintain all your stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, probably. Yeah, they had some noobs go in and train. I think it was like six months, and they were doing up to 27 sets for legs, and they were able to maintain everything they ever had with three sets later. It's funny. You'll see a lot of these big pro bodybuilders when they retire, and they'll say that their doctor's got to tell them they have to downsize. These guys l literally have to go into starvation diets to Bro, lose muscle. When John was alive, that's a, that's another really good discussion. So when John, that's, this is the protein discussion and the training discussion in one. When before John had the heart attack, you know, he, he retired yeah. he, before he had the heart attack and the heart attack was, wasn't steroid. That really pissed me off with people. It wasn't Boy, steroid related. Fucking mad, bro. Cause I, you have to understand, I love John Meadows like family. Like John was like family. So everybody people, loved John. John was a saint. Yeah. And so John had, it was, he had blood clots in his family, but he was scared yeah. to death of the blood clot stuff. But before he had the, the first heart attack, not before, not when he had the pulmonary you know, edema that killed him, but when he when he had the first heart attack, um, he was intentionally trying to downsize, and he's like, we, we used to laugh at it because John called me every week, and he's like, dude, he goes, I'm eating 98 grams of protein a day. He goes, and I just go in and do a couple of heart sets. He goes, and it just stays. And he was not on any drug. He was like just on yep. a legit. TRT dose. Here's the other thing, Paul, that people don't seem to get. Because I did real cycles for six years. I've been on legit TRT doses. I'm talking 120 to 150 milligrams of tests a week. I just, you just don't lose everything. Like no, you keep people, a lot. People don't believe me when I tell them, like, I'll come down to just 200, 200. Uh, last year I did 120 milligrams for like four or five And you months. don't lose it. You don't, don't lose, lose anything. It. You don't I, like, lose two, anything. I stay 270 the whole time. You know what's funny is I think Dante brought this up one time on the boards and he said if you blast in your kind of your thirties and build that 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 base, you can pretty much come off everything later and maintain with almost nothing. It's so true. Nobody talks about it. But John was on he sent me his diet one day and we were laughing. He's like, dude, that's ninety eight grams of protein. And I we were laughing because that's what he was eating. He didn't like to eat because you know he had the the surgery from the from yeah. getting his long intestine removed and all that. And so he really couldn't eat very much anyway. So he had diarrhea like all the time. He went through his whole life. He had diarrhea like every, like 20 times a day. That's what he had. It was, it was really bad. Like when we were in Australia, like he would have, we would have to make sure we were somewhere he could go to the bathroom at all times. So he was eating like 98 grams of protein a day. And he was training. He had stopped doing all the, John had gotten on board with me when I was, that's when I'd really started looking into the fatigue stuff more and like, John, all this shit that you're doing, all these drop set isometric holds, like stuff where you're killing yourself. I go, you realize that's not really doing anything, right? Like he's just creating this enormous amount of fatigue debt. Like you're just creating so much muscle damage to recover from. So he, he backed off that and he had already kind of started, but he was eating 98 grams of protein a day and he was just doing a few sets. We talked about it. Like we trained, we trained hard. There's our leg, the hardest training we did probably in those last like few years, we did on his, for his YouTube channel out in Vegas. And we did, we did, I want to, we did some leg extensions. We did a quad day. And if you just added up the sets, 
I want to say it was four sets. I could walk right for like the next week. But we did <laughs> we did leg extensions and we did John like high rep stuff. So we did three sets of 20 on leg extensions and then we did reverse banded hack squats and then we did like a this one leg press that he liked and then this this other leg press. But it was only like one working set of each of those. So it was like the leg extensions and then one set, one top set of each of those things. And dude, I was destroyed for like for days. But we he was not doing very much training. And he was still jacked. John was yeah. still he was still jacked. He maintained so much. Now the most jacked that he ever was he was running kind of like we talked about. It was when he was running some GH. It was some GH. One of the GHs he like, I dude, I've done a brand up all my Sarah's them. This is what John ran all the time. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he it was the you know what which one it was? You remember that video where he, where he and Anton were going around in the grocery store? Yeah. And grocery shopping. And John, John was like, dude, John was jacked at that time. I mean, he was jacked. And that's what he was doing. He was in this, his socks and sandals and his shorts and his tank top. And he was jacked, and that's what he was running at that time. But he was still really jacked, and he was like, dude, he goes, I just think it's the training. I don't think you need to eat that much protein. He goes, I think if you just train hard three or four days a week, you're pretty much going to keep everything you got. And I think that's lost on so many people. I think it's really good, like you're tra- talking about the protein stuff. You don't really need to gorge. You don't need to gorge yeah. protein. That's what I was, was talking about with the Jose Antonio stuff. I think that was the one thing. Again, not nit- nitpicking because you know Dante got so much good stuff, but the gorging the protein. There's ne- there's not an ounce of evidence anywhere that shows that it expedites muscle growth. Well, what you end up doing, and this is what I tell guys all the time, you're just at the end of the day, you ended up eating very expensive hard to digest carbohydrates because your body just ends up converting it to glucose in the in most cases the gluconeogenesis anyway and it's very and it, that's where a lot of the metabolic the the, uh, the metabolic demand you talk about for the metabolic cost of of processing protein the 20 percent or whatever it is was it uh, the 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 yeah it's, it's like 20 or 25 percent just for the digestive part but then if it's if there's if there's a spillover protein, either it just is, gets excreted out or there's gluconeogenesis, but there's, you don't really store it. But the fact is, you're just, you're just eating all this excess protein for really nothing. Yeah. It's going to be hard on your body. You're, you're, yeah, you're peeing, peeing it out. Um, you'll, you'll see it in blood work too. People will end up having, you know, a high bun if they're overeating yeah. protein as well. You'll, you'll see it. So it's just. You, you know, it's you, you putting probably, you know, people, you, you can debate the stress on your kidneys. They say it doesn't cause stress on your kidneys, but you will see elevated bond in people who are will, eating yep. too, too much protein. So re- yeah, really, it's, it's yeah, not really doing much of anything. It's just. Yeah. I, I just, it was that last study that came out that pissed everybody off. Do you remember this one? And again, I don't get into the nutritional stuff too much, but it, they showed that at 0.7 grams per pound of body weight that you would grow just fine. And I, yeah, was, yeah. I was like, that yeah. sounds about right. Because when I did, I did an article years ago and I went all the way back, Paul, this goes all the way back into the 70s. They knew this in the 70s, that 0.8 grams of it was about for all athletes. They were looking at recovery ability, muscle growth. It was 0.8 grams per pound of body weight, that little. That little, which is yep. still a decent amount, was plenty enough for all the needs they needed. These are natural athletes. And I'm like, so I think if you're dieting, it's, it probably does serve you to bump it up a little bit. Yeah, and there's benefits to it on dieting, too, and not just not just having the extra protein, but the satiety from, yep. from, from eating extra protein. I mean, nothing's more filling than eating a steak, right? So, I mean, that's why I see these guys that run carnivore diets, and they talk about, I lost weight, yada, yada. And I'm like, well, no shit, you lost weight, man. Because if you're, <laughs> if, you're, if, you're, if you're eating, if you're only eating, like you've, you've effectively eliminated all the trash from your diet. So you're not eating, you're not eating potato chips, you're not eating French fries, you're not eating donuts, you're not eating any of that stuff. And then you're eating a highly satiating food. I mean, you eat a 20 ounce ribeye, you're probably not going to want to eat the rest of the day. <laughs> right? So, yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, I don't, this is like not, this is not magical stuff. They're like, the one guy that said, he's like, I lost the most weight and he was eating, it was, he bought hamburger meat. He was buying like 80, 20 hamburger meat or something. 
And that's, that's all he ate. I'm like, well, of course it's all you ate. You don't want to eat anything after eating a bunch of that stuff. And you uh, you know what it's like when you put a bunch of fat and protein into a mixture yeah. together and you eat it? Like, you don't want to eat anything for like eight hours. So whatever calories you got out of that, which the protein's not going to get stored as fat anyway. So whatever calories. Yeah, it's, it's damn near impossible. If you look at the metabolic pathways <laughs> for which protein gets broken down, it, it would it would have to go through. It would have to go through. Alan and I did the breakdown on this one. So you would, you would have to cut out your, actually cut out your carbs and your fats and you would have to eat. It's like, so it, the amount of protein would be so. It'd be insane. thousands of grams. It would be thousands to store even like the most modicum of fat. Because I mean, it would have to be, it would have to go through gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis. And you would actually have to kind of overfill your carb storage. Then de, de novo lipogenesis after that, right? It so. would, it's, it's basically, it's an impossibility. So, if, like, if you're eating, like, 80, 20 hamburger meat, and some guy did this, and he lost a bunch of fat, I'm like, dude, I totally believe you. Because I think if you eat some fat, and that's why keto diet works for a lot of people, because yep. they're satiated. They're, they're satiated. Yep. So if you eat fat and you eat protein, you're not going to want to eat a whole lot else. Yeah, keto and carnivore is sort of a dummy-proof way of dieting. You don't, you won't. I mean, you don't have to count calories probably because you're not going to be likely not in a surplus from from the food. It would be period. difficult to get into the surplus unless you're one of those people who can just smash those. What do they call them? Those, those fat bombs. They make it those like keto yeah. parties. Yeah, I just like so it's sort of a stupid-proof way of dieting. So that's that's you know it's. In my opinion, it's not the best for optimizing performance in the gym or or for yeah. being a, a. You definitely you can't grow, you cannot grow, and then I would also going back to kind of like the contest prep that a little bit that we were talking about. Number one, you can't grow on it, but then in contest prep, the other thing about it is is if you're if you're low on glycogen, there's also going to be some issues. And I'd have to remember to go how go back through them. But if you had there's a if you're low on glycogen, there's a like I talked about there before, there's excitation, contraction, coupling failure that spills over. And generally what happens as well there is that if you're training in a way that increases that inflammatory response with muscle damage, it becomes harder to actually get glycogen, the glucose into the cells. Yep. So a lot of times you'll notice this, Paul, if you see guys, I think that training plays a huge part in peak week and how hard and dry some guys come in because there are some particular coaches that consistently have guys that I consider what have like kind of, they have a, it's almost like they always talk about how they couldn't get all the water out. Yep. And the guys that can get all the water out, number one are training too close to shows. And the other thing is when they are training close to shows, they're training either doing stuff like giant sets or intensifiers, or they're doing long muscle length movements, things that cause a lot of inflammation and by way of muscle damage, as I'm talking about. So one of the things the guys that one of the guys I used to work with for a long time was Fred Smalls and Fred could never get his legs. He'd always say, my legs won't come in. My legs won't come in. He jerked, worked with George Farah. Yep. And I said, the only when Freddie finally came in his best condition ever was when he won the Dallas Europa. And I didn't let him train legs for 20 days. Yeah, that's what I do. I have I have guys their last leg training session before a show is 10 days out. That's it. Yeah. And he was scared to death. But well, we did 10 to 12 days out and they still were not they still were not separated enough. I think it's I'm gonna have him on for an interview next week. I think it's AJ Sims. I'm pretty sure he pulls leg training out two weeks yep. from from shows. And his he gets guys too, drier think, than anybody else out there. I think there's so many guys that would benefit from literally just like the last at least the last ten days not doing anything and allowing all of that inflammation to come out of their body yep. uh, and being able to store their glycogen well and just resting. So that's what I do going into a show. I barely do anything the week of the show. Uh, yeah, I'll, uh, and then I'll I'll push my calories back up, and almost treat it as a deload or what, a rest week, whatever you want to call. It. You should be ready going into that week of the show, and you always well, look better when you do well, that. Well, you you should be ready two weeks out. Yeah, you should be in show condition two weeks out. So here's kind of my thought about that. If, if you're taking, so if, let's say you're running a gram of tests, and you're you chunked in. You know, some type of oral on top of it, like Anabar or whatever. Some guys run Anabar. I've heard you talk about orals and you hate orals. And I think that's really cool. Because in the off season, they have a use on contest. They have a use. Come 
pre-contest time because of fullness and and nitrogen retention and all that yep. gets, it comes to But if you're running a gramatas ball and you're running whatever oral that you want to use, like like John used anadrol. He liked anadrol going into shows. He thought anadrol kept him full going into shows. But whatever oral you want to use, and he always laughed and he said, these guys talk about anadrol gets you bloated. They just eat like garbage. He goes, yep. anadrol just fills you out. He goes, if yep. you bleed, it just fills you out. But what I was getting to with that is if you're taking this many androgens two weeks out for a show and you're already show ready and you decide not to train, you're not going to lose any muscle. No. No. And this, these guys are such in their heads. I'm like, dude, just take the two weeks off or take 10 days off. Don't train. Rest. Let that inflammation come down. You'll harden up. You'll you'll get dry. You'll get more separated. I see these dudes literally off training, like putting up training videos like that day before the show. I'm like, yep. dude, what are you doing? Like, how dumb is that? Yep. Like, you, what are you doing training the day before the show? I'm glad you mentioned that because I, I pull everything back about seven to ten days out from the show. Yep, and I think legs probably need to come out. For most guys, they would do well for experimenting at ten days. And then if you find at at 10 days, you're still not fully separated, pushing to 14 days. And like I said, when we got, when I got Freddie, when Freddie's leg and overall physique looked the best, we were, it was either 20 or 21 days that he didn't train legs. And then I think we cut everything out, 10, everything out for the most part, 10 days. And then I think it was the last few days when he was, when he did, was doing his carb loading. Like we, we mm -hmm. would go in and do some high rep work. We're really far away yep. from failure. That's exactly just, what I do. Just to kick off glute four, just to push yep. push yep. everything in. Um, but I, I think that stuff, people overcomplicate that stuff. And I think if you understand some of the mechanisms, really, like the mechanisms of how that stuff's work, really, it's not that difficult. But I really think the key that most guys are not getting to when it comes to getting into contest shape, getting to, if you follow the diet, right, and you're in a calorie deficit and you're doing your cardio and you're doing all that kind of stuff, I think the biggest key that most of these guys are missing is they're just training too close to the show. Yep, they're, not I agree. Allowing that, they're not allowing that inflammation to subside. And then just do a few light workouts the last few days, very far away from failure to just to kick off your glute four glucose transporter to kind of get yep. some of those carbs moved into the cell. And that's really it. That's all you need to do. I'll tell you another little thing that that's, that drives me nuts, and I see still a lot of coaches do it, is loading guys up on carbs when they're trying to water deplete at the same time. You cannot load glycogen without water. No, it's some, you have to have something to transport it. Yeah, it's it's like a four to one. I think it's three to one, four to one. I don't remember exactly the, the number off the top of my head, but for every gram of glucose you pull into the into the cell it, it, it needs I, is it three to one or is it i think it might be four to one it could i, th I think it's yeah, i think you're right i think it's four to one i can't remember i think it's four to one but but yeah, yeah i mean how are you going to load a thousand fifteen hundred grams of carbs without drinking water and then the guys end up with this big distended gut on stage and, because and it's all sitting in there okay that's the other thing i used to laugh okay do you notice that that has stopped the last few years? You don't see as many distended guts. Yep. And that's people. Okay. That was the other thing. I don't know how long you want this podcast to go, but we seem to actually have a lot of things that we like to talk about. But the the people called it GH gut. Well, if it was GH gut, then why does it Jay Keller still? Why does Jay Keller have a tiny little waist now? Yeah. Like it's it, food. It, it was food. And you know what it was? It was the peak week protocols they were using at the time. So the, everybody does the same bullshit. So once you get one guy that does something, they all start doing yep. the same stupid ass bullshit. So what they were doing was, is they were pulling water and they were throwing in diuretics a day or two, like out from the show, which why yep. are you throwing in diuretics two days out from the show? Holy shit. Yeah. You're not going to be loading any glycogen if you're, if you're uh, promoting diuresis. I mean, either, you know, so everything's going that way. Yeah. Yeah, it's, so it's what, what are, you are you loading or are you pulling stuff out? But you can't do both. So if, if you these guys, what they would do is is they would they would they would do the diuretics, cut all their water like two days out, and then they would try to carb load and they would stuff themselves full of food and it couldn't go anywhere. Yep. So it would just sit there and they'd have these giant guts and people were like, "That's a roid gut. It's a GH gut. It's insulin." I'm like. Yep. No, it's not. It's the protocol they're using for people. Now you don't see those on stage anymore. 
Well, I've heard, I don't know how true it is, but Hani Rambad, who seems to get guys in the best shape, he doesn't use insulin on peak week from what I've heard. And he also has his guys pull their food way back the day day before and the day of the show. Yeah, and like somebody... While he water depletes. Yeah, and somebody had asked me because I... They, they, we actually did a study on the FS7 training protocol. A lot of his training stuff is is not like it's, I wouldn't call it like very good or whatever. But as far as like him getting guys ready for shows, yep. he's phenomenal. Phen- yep. like his guys come in dry. They yeah. come in in shape. They yep. absolutely come in in shape. And he, you never see Haney's guys come in with the distended guts. They're always hard. They're always tight. They're yep. always have good separation. So he really understands what he's doing with that stuff. And that's an interesting thing. And I saw, I think it was Bumstead had posted up on his YouTube. He was as low as like 1600 calories, yep. like one Olympia. So they, he brings the food way down. I think all that's so smart. I think all of that is so smart. I think Haney's Clearly, he's really good about that stuff. When it comes to getting his guys ready for the, sh- the stage, he's fantastic. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's what I've heard. That that that's what he does at the end is that he pulls, pulls. I mean, like there's just so many like these entrenched ideas that I think are just idiotic. Like I just like <laughs> the whole like the whole carb loading without water never made any sense. <laughs> Start, starting diarrhea. Okay. Paul, where does it where does it go? <laughs> it just it just, it sits, just sits there, there right? There. I mean, anybody who's ever done a show, like I've done shows in the past where I've done that before. And what's the first thing that happens when you drink a bunch of water? You take a giant shit, man. <laughs> That's yeah, what happens after the show. Yep, yeah. it all comes out, man. It, it was all just sitting in there; it wasn't doing anything. Yeah, and I don't think I also think that um, you can. Uh, you, I mean, you have to be careful with the quote unquote not spilling over. But here's the other part I really feel like is the spillover effect. Guys are not lean enough. Yeah, Anytime the guys, Paul, come on, bro. Every time I hear the spillover bullshit, I'm like, dude, you're just fat. If we're talking yeah. about contest shape, anytime if you you know this from getting lean enough, you basically the, the whole I spilled over stuff is some bullshit. Well, I heard I heard Simpson Dowda talking about like this past week or whatever, meaning you know better peak week and all this stuff. And I'm like, dude, you're like eight percent body fat. That's why you're not. <laughs> <laughs> it has nothing to do with the. <laughs> Dude, it, the reason why that you you looks like you didn't peak compared to to Hottie is because Hottie was peeled and you're not. Yeah, That's, Hottie was five percent body fat. You were eight. That's uh, Hottie was difference. yeah. He was like four and a half percent body fat. You're like eight. the reason why that one guy had absolutely was absolutely dry peeled to the because he was just that lean. Yeah. So the fact, but the other thing is, is that Milos uses that that approach to training. I'm talking the about. Fill, he does a fill and spill, the whole thing. Like they push carbs really hard and yep. a lot of food and going into the, the show. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm telling you, I, this is not, I think I'm the greatest guy. I think I could fix so many guys' conditioning if they were already lean enough as far as how they look in terms of hardness and dryness and separation by just giving them the best. Anybody watching this, pull back on your training. Pull back on your training. Have the last few days going into show, do some light light pump work far from failure yep. to kind of get everything moving into the cell. But that's, you, you don't need to be training hard the last few weeks at all. I uh, work with, I don't know if you know Justin Harris at all, but I've been working with him for years. Yeah. Now. But, uh, Justin's like, you have two jobs on contest prep. It's to get rid of all your body fat and to not lose muscle. Those are your two jobs. That's it. When Matt, when Matt Porter was alive, I remember... He had this really great quote. This was, it, it was really, it was so true. And it was something I kind of hinted at earlier. And he talked about guys getting in condition. He's like, dude, you're on steroids at the minimum. Don't just don't eat any food. You don't have any damn excuse for not being shredded. Come show day. <laughs> you're on steroids. You're not going to lose any tissue. Just it comes down to it. Just don't eat food. Like you're, yeah. you're not going to lose any tissue. Like if you, if it's really that hard for you, just don't do this, this sport. But at the end of the day, being on stage in condition, like this whole peak week may can offset your like water retention. But Paul, you should know this, man. If you're truly peeled, it's not really going to make that much of a difference. Like if no, you are, a lot of times when I've, I've been like, I, I use, I think I pride myself on getting lean, but like, I, I don't like, usually don't even need a diuretic. Yeah. John figured that out by accident. He started figuring out stuff he did not need whenever he didn't have access to it. He had one show that he came in. It was the hardest. He said it was the hardest he ever was. And he actually didn't have a diuretic. 
And after the show, he goes, well, like I said, I don't need those. <laughs> and it was, he figured out, he's like, I, I don't yeah. really, if he could manage his, his water intake, his sodium intake and his carb intake, and he was lean enough for the show, that was it. Yeah, you don't need it. You don't need it. There are some situations where you might, but most of the time I don't even use it. I'm usually one of the leanest guys on stage, you know, but it's just getting fat free first. You got to get fat free. And like you were saying, it's got to be done by a couple of weeks out from the show. I think two weeks out from the show, you should basically you should be ready to step on stage two weeks out. Two yeah. weeks out from the show, you should be step on stage. You know, and another thing, I, another thing I tell guys is not letting yourself get too fat in the off season, man. It just never, it it never benefits you. Well, we just recently had that. That's another thing I think that's kind of been debunked over the last when people say nothing has changed. So you remember it used to be like like big bulk cycles. Remember back in the eighties yep. and nineties, guys would get mega fat. And we had. I always go back. to let's look at look at what the studies look at for natural guys. And this is all you. This is all you have to say. This is why I actually like research and why a lot of the the guys that are just coaching at the pro level and use drugs. When they argue with me, I'm like, dude, I am talking about what really goes on physiologically. So if I know I could put you on steroids, you can do anything, cool. But if I can also tell you the most absolute best, most efficient, optimal way to do this without them, all that you getting on does is make it way better. Yep. Makes that way better. 100%. Right? So if you have an off season and you're trying to maximize your growth, what they figured out through a multitude of studies was like, kind of what we were talking about earlier with the menstrual stuff. You don't really need much more than about 10 or 15 percent over your maintenance intake to actually maximize that muscle growth. You don't need to be eating like the whole power shoveling, like I'm eating stuff and throwing up in my mouth and like all that kind of shit that we used to have to hear about. You don't I now I did that stuff. I'm not I'm not I'm not being well, we all have. like we anybody because we all believe that at one time, right? But if I could do the do-over again, I would have stayed. I said this on a podcast, boy, people got mad about this. And I said, even for guys just doing a bulk and cut, I said in the off season, I don't think there's really much of a reason to get above 12 to 15% body fat. If you're 20%, you're just fat, bro. Can we just yep. get real with this? And people got mad at me. And they and I said, can you tell me, this is how I work and people hate on me and talk shit on me and all this kind of stuff, but I don't attack people. Don't, there's only a couple of people I really don't like, but I debate the data. And yep. I said, can you tell me something physiologically that's going on at 15% body fat that helps you grow more than that isn't going on at 12% body fat? So I understand we need to be in a calorie surplus in order to grow the most effectively. But what does that serve? Like you talked about, if you break down a pound of muscle tissue, what are we talking about in terms of grams? So if we know we can only grow tissue so fast, and I want Let's say even at the new rate, like 10 grams a month or some shit, it's like not very much. It's very tiny. Yeah. So if, if we know through the research physiologically that we've looked at that, say, a 10 percent surplus in, you know, you know, above, you know, above maintenance, 10 percent over maintenance was kind of growing at pretty much at the same rate that the 15 and 20 percent surpluses were. Then you get, if, what is your, then you're doing a bulk and a cut. Let's say you're not even a stage guy. I said, well, I think a cut should take a guy down to seven to 8% body fat. If you're talking about a real cut, seven or 8%. And then, because to me, stage level lean is around four or five. Five. Like yeah. stage level, right. Like it's, it's like few people can get to four, but five is about the, the target. So if you're doing a regular do cut, seven or 8%. Kind of the ballpark range. I feel like that you you should shoot for, and then for your bulk, no more than twelve to fifteen. People got mad about that. I'm like, dude, if you are quote unquote a fitness guy, an athlete, whatever, why are you above twelve percent body fat? Like, what are and what are you doing above fifteen? What are you doing above fifteen? Yeah, it's just it's just extra trash. I mean, you think about it. Logically, you know, if I have to, I mean, right now I'm getting ready to start contest prep in two weeks. I am right now 18 pounds over my stage weight. But for my last show. Fantastic. Right. Right. So you tell me the guy that has to lose 50 pounds or me losing 18, who's going to have a better chance of hanging on to tissue getting ready for show? And not to mention that you can say, I'm going to do a 10 week diet. I don't have to do these a massive. Yeah, I can, get, I can get in shape in 10 weeks. 
But not only that, you could even say you have more flexibility. Okay, so here's the thing. The guy that's 50 pounds overweight, if he starts whatever, he's still got to be aggressive the whole time. You could literally do an aggressive early cut and then dial your calories back up. And actually that's what I do going into the show. Exactly. But you have a multitude of things that you can do that cause you that allow you more, so much more flexibility than the guy that's 50 pounds overweight. Yep. Unless he's going to set his target at six months out. And now he's dieting for six months. But if you're 18 pounds over, you're like, I can do an eight, 10 week cut. I'll make it in time and I'll be in great shape. Like we, well, you can see it too on how people look on stage. You know, we were talking about fatigue earlier. Who's going to be more fatigued and trashed when they when they're getting on stage? The guy's got to lose fifty, or the guy's got to lose eighteen. Yeah, and it used to be. Remember back in the day, thirty was the normal cut. Remember the all stage yeah. stage weight was 30, 30 was the cut. And I, I still think I think, dude, I think you're a hundred percent spot on. But like I said, that brought me back to every time that I would see a clip of you talking, whether you were talking about dieting or. Where you're talking about drugs, I always thought, man, this guy's got a really good, like your, I think your approach is very good and very sound, very intelligent because that's the approach. Even when you're, like you said, you're like, I don't even like talking about drugs anymore. But every time I hear you talk about drugs, even though I've, I've done a, a, a brain dump on drug stuff, you'd always be like, you just need a little bit of test. And then during a show, chunking an oral. And I'm like, that's exactly what I used to think. Like, you, you know how I've come to these conclusions, man? It's from, I've made every fucking mistake you could possibly make over the years. And I've just figured out, well, this, I don't, it's just like you said, like John figured out, well, I don't need that. I don't need that. Right. right? Like he, he it, figured out early, he couldn't take trend. And it's, it's an Occam's razor approach to, I mean, like with the drugs, I mean, there, there is a cost of taking the drugs. I mean, you're putting stress on your body and taking the drugs. So, I mean, if you're. You know, especially like the off season, like guys wanting to pound orals and things like that. If your liver is taxed, if your digestion is messed up from taking orals and all these other things, yep. I mean, how effective is your off season going to be? Anyway? That was one of the telltale signs when I was on. I wrote about wrote about that in my Q and A last night. Is one of the things that scared me. Number one, I had elevated blood pressure. And then I think you can look at me. Some guy wrote about TRT daddy. He said, you can always tell these guys that are on because they're always red from their blood pressure. Bro, pedals a ghost. Like, I'm like, I'm like <laughs> I, 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 say what? Yeah, me too. Yeah. I'm like, I'm pedals a ghost. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, you see my, my, I'm red. Cause I'm in the gym. You see gym clips. Yes. I'm red. I'm in the gym. I'm like, but I'm pale as a ghost. I'm, I'm like, my blood pressure is 118 over like 75. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. But yeah. I some- on, I, my blood, dude, I'm so big about blood pressure stuff. So when I was on my blood pressure, like 170 over 120, 130. Oh, and yeah, that's the nuts. part that would scare me was I would have that, but then I would also have that consistent like heartburn thing. And that I was like, man, that's not good. And it would always happen when I get on orals, right? I would yep. get that that gird <laughs> oh my god it was awful dude and that's that's even the weird thing now is i still get accused of being on it's such a weird weird thing because like i said i, I think that there's this disconnect with a lot of the kids that they see anybody who has any appreciable amount of muscle mass has to be taking a bunch of trend or is on yeah. or whatever and they You don't realize I spent 20 years natural building my base natural. I was 255 natural. And then I, when I cut down, I was 205, probably 10 or 12% body fat. So I was, had a pretty good base natural before I ever got on. And when I was on, I got all the way up to 290. And then when I I came off, I just got down into the 230s and dude, I can, you know, like my girlfriend talks about the fact that she's like, nobody would believe you really don't eat anything. I'll have my cheat meal on Fridays, but I, like I eat so little the rest of the time and I stay almost 240 pounds. It just doesn't take much. Yeah. I get tired of eating. I've kind of taken an eating break over the last couple months. Just, you know, just, just to give us, and I'm the same way, man. When I, when I don't want to eat, I'm the opposite. I, I, I'll cut yeah. down to like three meals a day. Fasting is fun, man, because you just like, you just, you don't even realize how much, t- how much time you spend when you're like in a gaming ma- mode during the day, having to plan out to eat. Yeah rules your life <laughs> take takes it's, over it's a it's a it's an absolute full-time job and so like it's uh it's a weird thing now like when these kids will say stuff about me being on and i'll be like 
I've been off for like a decade now. I post my blood work online. I'm like, I post stuff all the time about, hey, guys, <laughs> take this and take that stuff to when you get off to make sure you're taking care of yourself. Because when I turned 40 and retired from powerlifting, dude, I didn't have that mindset. I still think, I think there's a lot of guys that do retire now, like oh, Roley now, like got off, looks great. Like he clearly got off for like a lot yep. of the year. But dude, the comments are terrible because they're like, he's shrunk, he's nothing, nice, whatever. I'm like, dude, he doesn't need to be huge anymore. He doesn't compete. Well, there's a lot of social pressure, especially with social media to keep, to maintain a certain look. You know, people, I, I can see why guys get addicted and don't want to come off because it's like, you don't want to, people pointing their fingers at you and saying you look like shit i can but i still think paul i think you, you can come off and one of the things i remember talking to john about this come off get really lean stay shredded you know who i still think looks fantastic like lee labrada still looks great yeah yeah lee, lee labrada still looks you great think he's what mid 60s dude he's yeah he's like 65 now looks fantastic yeah right so I, I think that a lot of guys don't realize you can get really lean and being really lean is what gives that appearance actually of being more jack um do you ever notice that like the only time i ever get accused of actually like being on like a person is when i get really lean again and people will be like bro did you get back on i'm like nope just dieting hard that's I, the I always, only time I always, I always laugh when i'm on contest prep when i'm down like 30 pounds <laughs> and i'm the weakest i am all year people are like man you got huge what are you doing i'm like i lost 30 pounds <laughs> <laughs> my 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 buddy Joel is a natural guy, and people accuse him of being on. And the only time he gets accused of being on is when he gets ready and he's ready when he's show ready because he you know he's he's shredded and looks really good. And people will be like, "Dude, you clearly on stuff." And he's like, "I'm 167 pounds. Like, <laughs> like I don't know what what you think that I'm on." So it, it's I tell those guys like when I turned 40, I was like, "I'm coming off. I quit powerlifting." I was like, I don't have this desire to be on anymore. I want to make sure I take care of myself and take care of my health. You know, I got with my doctor who does all of my hormones. I did my brain up on steroids. I'm like, I don't, I, I can never take trend. I, I get accused of being on trend. I'm like, dude, I, I have a trend story. I took trend for eight days and I was breathing heavy playing Xbox. And I'm like, this is not for me. I was I like, fucking hate trend, man. I don't know what the love affair is with I. I will take it at the end of contest prep just because nothing makes me look the way it does. But I keep the doses super low, man. I'm like running 20 milligrams a day. I'm talking about nothing. 140 a week. And I, I took it. I took it for eight days and I couldn't breathe. And I was like, and I didn't even know what it was. I was in the shower. I remember it was in the shower the first time I noticed it. So I was like, okay, I'm going to run the trend ace and I'm going to do like the least, least little amount possible because all the horror stories come with it. And so I, I did like the least amount. I think probably it was like a quarter of a, like a CC or something. I can't remember how much it was not much, you know, and then you got to pin it like every four days or something. So I remember I did it. And then like four or five days later, I pinned again and I didn't, you know, I didn't get the trend cough and the air, you know, I didn't go long enough to, but I remember I was in the shower and I was like, why am I breathing so heavy? Like, I know I'm a big fat piece of shit right now, but why am I breathing so heavy? I've never breathed quite this heavy. And I was sitting in my video game chair playing Xbox and just like, <sighs> oh, oh, it affects your ability, your cardiovascular. How do you do cardio so on it? It's tough, man. Take enough clenbuterol and ephedrine, you can make it work. <laughs> oh my God. See, that's what I mean. Like I just I, I think it was John told me because he couldn't take trend. He 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 loved taking masteron instead. Masteron. Yeah. No sides. And he said he got felt he got just as hard and looked just yeah, as master on masteron. On. That's what I don't know if you ever talked to John Jewett, but he's a big masteron guy. Yeah, John looks great too. Yeah. I mean, I just saw him a couple weeks ago. Holy fuck, he's huge. Yeah, every time that he pops up in my feed, I'm like, dude, that dude's a monster. He's an absolute monster. Yeah, I, I talked to him, hung out with him a little bit at the Arnold Classic, and good lord, he's dense. Yeah, he is. Ab yeah, he he looks absolutely amazing. He stays in shape year round too. Yeah, he's lean. Yeah, all the time, and that's what yeah. I mean. I think that I really think that if you're going to approach body film, bodybuilding from what I'd call an intelligence standpoint, I think you, you talk really, that's why I reference somebody when they're like, who should we go to? I wouldn't, I think the guy we're talking about maybe is the guy we were talking about earlier is his initials VB. Yes. Yes. Okay. Then we're talking about the same guy. We're talking that, about the same that, guy. Yeah. We're talking about the same guy. That dude is an absolute jackass. 
So when people ask me that, I always tell them, I say, go check out Paul's stuff because I feel like he speaks intelligently on steroids and I can't talk about I got a, I got a funny story about Mr. VB. He, he accused <laughs> me of copying him. <laughs> I heard this. Okay. So then I heard so like people reach out to me and they're like, this guy, like, like you're copying, you're copying his models. And I'm like, I'm his, like pro his protocol is protocol. I'm like, right? who the fuck is this guy? I'm like, I've never even heard of him. So I, I went and listened to some of his stuff and I'm like, all right, I'll, I'll subscribe to his course and see what he's got on his stuff and check. I'm always willing to listen and learn from people. And then dude starts like trashing me and telling me I'm copying him. I'm like, we were talking about this shit on the message boards 15 years ago. Yeah. He was the guy who said there's, there's been no change in training. Like we haven't learned anything about training and the last 20 years i'm like yeah that's not true that's a that's question. not true <laughs> yeah that's we learn we know a lot more about training like i still have to debate these stretch mediated hypertrophy people like every every couple of weeks when they absolutely do not understand how that works either but i'm like there's we have a a there's a ton of stuff that we know about training um that that's completely different now but a lot of those guys get stuck in that yeah he came at me a while back and somebody asked me did did you ever use the his protocol i'm like well dude i've been off drugs for almost 10 years i didn't use anybody's protocol i figured out i could use test and i could use npp and that was about all i could use well i'll tell you what his protocol is it's take test master on gh and a blood pressure medicine i mean like that's fucking genius i mean, <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I, mean I mean really and and if you take less, you're not as at risk, you know, stay away from the dangerous stuff like trend and orals. I mean, I think we all, anybody that's done this for a while, sort of. Okay, so basically he knows as much as I do, because if somebody were asking me, I would say, take some tests. You can take mass and not get the side effects. Got to get lean first. If you can afford GH, you could throw that in, but I don't think it's necessary. And then probably three weeks out from the show, you could throw in an oral of your choice. I mean, basically, it's it's stay away from the toxic shit, take lower doses, manage your blood pressure, and you're going to be safer. I mean, that's not rocket science in my book. I mean, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Yeah. I just didn't. He ended up coming. There's nothing out. wrong with the message. I can separate the message from the messenger. The message, the message is is great. The messenger is not. I, think <laughs> I don't know what else to say. I I think that's the problem that people though have often had with me is that they take me the the wrong way. I think in accordance to like I said, I don't, dude. If you tell Were me, you're just blunt. I think I think that's why people. But I, I had I also hear like people will say, "Well, Paul's contrary," and I'm like, "I'm really not contrary." And I, I try to write in what I consider to be like any kind of entertaining style. Otherwise, this stuff can be dry and boring. Well, you ask so, questions. I mean, that's that that can you know that that's good. Like we were talking about at the beginning, being you know invoking critical thought. You ask questions to invoke critical thought. Right. Why? Well, yeah, I mean, and and but here's the thing. Also, at the end at the end of the day, Paul, there's people need to get better at asking better questions right. because if you have a caption that you that you won't read or you won't, if I give you the studies. Here's the thing that irritates me because I'm self-taught. I dropped out of school after ninth grade. Everything that I know, like I've, I've learned because I taught myself. So I don't have any empathy for these guys. Do you, does that make sense? Like I don't, I have no yeah. empathy for these guys because they have access to all the same research and data that I do. So if I'm literally giving you the stuff and I do a free podcast where I talk about this in detail, then I've actually already done all the homework for you. So I don't have any empathy for you when you won't read a caption that would only take you 60 seconds to read and then you won't read it. And then you say, I'm an asshole for telling you to go read a caption. So uh, people are intellectually lazy. I, I, I just, you know, I had an example of it recently. I had a guy that was, we were talking about the keto thing. Like I was telling the keto, to eat. it's all damn near impossible to grow muscle while you're on keto. You can't. And he sent me a, a research article that said it, the title of it was, can you grow muscle while on keto? He did not go through and read any of it. He literally disproved his own point when he sent me that he just sent me a link to an article that he didn't read. And I'm like, I'm like, come on, man. I had a, a girl that tried to debate me on TikTok. This one, this one was pretty wild. So a few years ago, one of the research groups had decided to put it into this whole muscles torn down and build back bigger was the Felipe DeMoss and those guys. And they actually did a multitude of really, really good studies, right? 
that looked at muscle damage and myofibrillar protein synthesis and the, the repeated bout effect and everything. And they laid it out really like it's a, it's a really, really couple of years well done body of work. And so she was debating me, of course, muscles torn down and, and built back a cure. That's how it works in here. Cause you're so stupid. Go read this, this study. She literally linked me to the DeMoss study that showed that I'm like, you didn't, you don't even know what you're linking to me. Like you're, it's yourself owning your, it's self ownage. You're just owning oh, yourself. And that was the funniest one I've ever had when I'm like, I, that would be the study I would give you. To, to get you, because at the end of the study, you don't even need to, you don't actually need to read the whole study. You will go to the bottom and it tells you, thus we conclude that muscle damage is not a facilitator of muscle hypertrophy. They end the whole thing with that. Yeah, it's it's amazing how, how intellectually lazy people are. It's it's It blows my mind sometimes. Man, I got to wrap this up, man. I didn't realize we've been on for two and a half hours. This is crazy. This is the longest interview I've ever done, man. <laughs> I don't know if that's a if that's a good or bad thing, but I, I mean, it's I, a great thing. I, I really, really enjoy talking. I was actually looking forward to our podcast. I figured, I figured we'd have a lot of, of good things to hit on. And like I said, I always, I always reference people over your stuff. I still think you keep on. I know you don't like talking about it, but I think it's important to keep talking. Oh, I do about androgens because, <laughs> because first off, number one, I don't. I'm not going to talk about them because I don't take them. And even though I get asked about them, I'm like, guys, that's why I tagged you the other night. I'm like, just go read Paul's stuff because he he's got some good stuff on that. So I always reference people to you for that. So I I hundred percent, dude. I think you do a great job of talking you, about that stuff it. and putting out intelligent information that people can digest and not hurt themselves with. Thank you. I appreciate it. Paul, if people want to get a hold of you or what what where can they get a hold of you? What do you have any products or anything you want to promote? The only thing that I do with training is I do my training groups now. They're on train heroic and I have four different groups. I have a Valkyrie the Valkyrie, which is like for ladies who really want to grow glutes and legs and stuff like that. We still do upper body stuff, but we specialize a little more for ladies in that one. I have a new beginner group that has just exploded. It has been really cool called Yoke Buds. And the reason why it's called Yoke Buds is because I started, my first group was the Yoke Squad. And the Yoke Squad started four years ago. And it's for, for guys who are more, are more advanced and want to specialize a little more in specific muscle groups. And then I have Garage Gangsters, which is people who are at, at home and training for hypertrophy at home, and they have a limited amount of equipment. And those are my four groups. Those are the ones I've kind of figured out cover, pretty much cover all the bases. And I have okay. everything from IFBB pros to NFL players and all sorts of stuff that are in my groups and run my program. So it's pretty cool. Awesome, man. Well, I appreciate you coming on, man. Thank you. Yeah, dude, thanks for having me on. I had a, a fantastic time. For coaching or consultations, head over to www.anabolicbodybuilding.com to book your spot today. I can help you with optimizing hormones, fat loss, muscle gain, physique, athletic performance, nutrition, and health. For more information, shoot me an email at bigp3rd at gmail.com.